statement, my intervention, I will talk mostly about, of course, distributional uh, effects of monetary policy uh, in the context then of uh, the impact of macro uh, macroeconomic policies on uh, distribution. And uh, there has been a certain neglect uh, in, uh, in economics during many years on matters related to distribution um, at macro level. Uh, except perhaps in the 90s where, where we can find the literature that is well summed up uh, by, in, in the book by Aguillon and Williamson, uh, Growth, Inequality and Globalization. Uh, and during that period there were papers examining the relationship between uh, uh, growth and inequality, uh, which in general reached two main conclusions. Uh, first, that the, um, the uh, Kuznets' hypothesis that uh, as uh, income grew, uh, inequality would uh, be reduced was true only until 1970 or 1970s, and then it uh, changed completely. And second, that uh, indeed uh, over uh, long periods of time, uh, I refer mostly to a paper uh, in the American Economic Review by Person and Tabellini, for nine advanced economies from 1830 to 1985, where they could not find any positive relationship between inequality and more growth. So, with the exception of that period and their literature that then was not uh, pursued, there has been some uh, neglect. And that, uh, for that, there are perhaps two main reasons. One is uh, uh, mentioned by Per uh, Crusoe uh, in uh, one of his more recent uh, papers, commenting another paper, which is that there was the presumption, the idea, that uh, uh, distribution would not affect the outcomes of the aggregates of the economy. So, from the macro point of view, it was not then uh, uh, analyzed. And second, uh, that then uh, the distribution was left uh, uh, in economics to microeconomics and to basically uh, the theories of factor price and that at the macro level the approach, the only approach would be then trickle down economics and nothing else. Well, these two presumptions, uh, these two reasons were shattered by the crisis, of course. We have uh, many uh, papers, uh, Mian and Sufi, uh, Chris Carroll, uh, John Muell Bauer and others, showing conclusively that the marginal propensities to consume of different uh, uh, sources of wealth and income are such that are crucial to explain the aggregate behavior of consumption. And second, also shattered by the fact that uh, the inequality has been increasing so much that the empirical and analytical work of uh, uh, Atkinson, uh, Piketty, Saez, uh, Milanovic, uh, and many others, show indeed that the trend has been towards more and more uh, inequality, and that is behind the sort of social and political turbulence that we have seen in the aftermath of the crisis. And we all know the data, so uh, it's uh, not a secret uh, indeed that in particular, as shown here from the latest uh, paper by uh, Piketty, uh, Saez, Zuckman, and, and others, uh, that the uh, developments of income from 78 to 2015 are indeed, uh, uh, say, shocking, particularly in the US and China, uh, with a big explosion of uh, inequality in both cases. Uh, the average increase in the US 59, uh, but the bottom 50 minus 1, uh, in China 811 and 404 uh, and 1, in France much more balanced, 39-39, and indeed in European countries, if we look to the Gini coefficient evolution since 1970 of disposable income, we see that indeed since 70 there was an increase in the UK, the long blue line, and in the US, uh, and in the other European countries here represented, there has been stability, in particular, there has been stability of the Gini coefficient since the beginning of the 90s. So, much more balanced uh, in Europe. 
And uh, uh, we also know uh, that there is a big difference between these results, uh, the results uh, uh, referring to disposable income after tax and transfers, and the results before tax and uh, transfers. And we see there that for European countries, there is a difference on average, that's the bar in the middle, there is a difference on average of 20 percentage points between the market outcomes and the uh, outcomes after tax and transfers. Whereas in the rest of the world, many countries represented there, it's below 10. So it's more than the double, the correction by tax and transfers in Europe, um, which explains part of the stability. In our own um, household uh, finance and, uh, in, uh, and uh, income survey, uh, we, we have two, two uh, points of observation. We have two at the level of the euro area as a whole uh, for each country. In 2010 and 2013, we see here the Gini coefficient development between the two uh, points uh, in terms of wealth and in terms of income. There is hardly any change. So there is also stability between these two years with this granular uh, uh, information that we get from those surveys, and also the position of the top 5% of households has been also stable, both in what regards wealth and uh, income. So, does this mean, does this mean that uh, uh, there are no problems? In particular, one could, uh, looking to this evidence, one could say, well, the uh, distribution of income and wealth is a slow-moving phenomenon and which means that it should be mostly dependent from structural and institutional factors and not so much relevant at the uh, uh, business cycle frequency and, uh, uh, and so also not so much related with monetary policy in particular, especially in countries where monetary policy ensures a low inflation regime because uh, we know that higher inflation would be detrimental to uh, distribution. So does this mean that, uh, contrary to many opinions that one can read, and I don't want to uh, be in denial there, uh, that the unconventional monetary policies have not uh, had a negative impact on the distribution? Uh, well, I will try to show that's not the case uh, in the uh, euro area uh, case, uh, but I am not then not uh, avoiding the issue. And I'm uh, basing uh, the further slides I have to uh, present on the work being done uh, in the ECB, uh, particularly by two researchers, uh, Michele Lenza and uh, Giri uh, Slakalek, uh, where they uh, first apply a, a Bayesian VAR to explain the main variables that are relevant both for the distribution of wealth and income, meaning house prices, stock prices, and employment and wages. Um, and they do that for four countries only, uh, for the biggest four countries. But in this slide, we see that the impact on these uh, variables is sufficiently heterogeneous to be representative of what has happened in the euro area as a whole, taking these uh, four countries. And the results they get uh, is indeed scaling to a particular impact of uh, our measures uh, of the uh, purchase uh, programs uh, of securities, the impact on house prices, which dominates the, the, the blue uh, bar, and not so much on stock prices, and the decrease in unemployment, and the slight increase in wages. And that's the aggregate of the four countries. Now, disaggregating these, uh, uh, then by taking the uh, structure of uh, wealth and incomes coming from the survey on, uh, uh, that we uh, do uh, um, regularly, as I say, we have only two, but we will continue to have these surveys uh, in the future. Disaggregating then by household and then uh, building quintiles, we see that in terms of wealth, the lowest quintile is the one that has benefited most from development of the uh, components of wealth that uh, are affected by the, uh, um, uh, the purchase programs that we uh, conduct. 
And that is, of course, because the house prices dominate. Uh, and then in relation to the medium uh, wealth of each quintile, oh my god, um, then, uh, okay. This should not come as a surprise because in another previous paper of last year, Adam and uh, uh, Zamburani, uh, analyzing the structure of wealth of the families from these surveys and applying just a 10% increase uh, on house prices, stocks, and bonds, have this result. Yeah. Uh, then on, uh, on wealth, then there is this impact. Now, they also distribute then by household the effect on the variables that are relevant for income, meaning unemployment and wages. And as you see there, the effect on the lowest uh, uh, quintile uh, in the reduction of unemployment is the one that benefits the most, most, which means that heading to the wages, the overall impact on uh, income uh, income of our um, purchase uh, programs uh, benefits most the lowest uh, quintile. Uh, so, uh, which means that uh, indeed the uh, effects of monetary policy uh, are and have been somewhat subdued from the distributional point of view because distribution is mostly affected by structural uh, factors, drivers that have to do with productivity, skill bias, technological progress, globalization, and progressive uh, and the uh, degree of progressive tax and transfers that are applied in different countries. And I leave the final message that I have in that slide, which uh, would be controversial, but uh, I leave that for the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the European Economic Association and to the uh, European Central Bank for having me on uh, this uh, uh, important panel on uh, distribution and macroeconomic uh, modeling. It's an honor for me to be uh, a part of uh, such a distinguished uh, panel. And uh, if you want to uh, blame somebody, please blame Michael Ehrman, who should have known better, but still invited me to come. Now, I, I have a very simple message, uh, which uh, is based on the fact that the uh, topic of this session fits very well into work that we're doing at the International Monetary Fund. The uh, Fiscal Monitor, which is our flagship uh, publication on uh, fiscal policy is going to be devoted to inequality this fall. And I'm doing some work myself uh, with uh, Paolo Mauro and Tigran Pogosian on how to think about measures of uh, uh, inequality and efficiency that one can use when thinking about policy, micro and macro uh, policies. And uh, we're also doing, uh, at the fund, uh, work on modeling. And I will be giving you a uh, very brief uh, sample of that work, uh, work by uh, Lisa Razo, uh, Peralta, and Poig, who have built a relatively simple uh, general equilibrium model with uh, three types of households and uh, three sectors that allows one to look at distribution uh, uh, issues in a stylized uh, model. In a nutshell, what I will be doing is uh, uh, arguing that a measure which was introduced uh, many years ago by Tony Atkinson, the equally distributed equivalent income, is a measure that allows us to, s to take into account simultaneously the mean level of income, if one would oversimplify something like GDP per capita, and the overall distribution of income across households 
into one single indicator. And moreover, that indicator is, as GDP per capita, expressed in monetary units. So you have a very easy interpretation of the measure that you're using. Moreover, as Oaken showed many years ago, one can parameterize that, uh, uh, that uh, welfare uh, indicator on the basis of a very simple and intuitive experiment, the leaky bucket experiment. And so uh, if you're able to tell me how much would you be willing to lose to make a transfer from a rich household to a poor household, then this methodology allows you to parameterize the, uh, the uh, welfare function and then put it to use. And I will be giving you some examples of how uh, we can do that. So I've uh, given you the bottom line, so the chair can interrupt me at any time. You already know what the bottom line is, right? So if one looks at uh, social welfare functions and one looks at level curves for the social welfare function, one can think in red that if you have poor households and rich households, if you have a simple utilitarian uh, weighting, you would have a straight line like you have there in uh, red. If in the extreme you care only about the welfare of the worse off, you have a kink like what you have there in uh, yellow. Now, what the function that uh, Atkinson proposed does is allow one to go from one to the other smoothly on the basis of a inequality aversion parameter. So if you start with an inequality aversion parameter of 0.2, you have something which is very close to the straight line. And as you increase the inequality aversion parameter, you go closer and closer to the kink. When you have an inequality aversion parameter of two, you're already uh, very close to the uh, full kink, to the uh, Rossian uh, uh, result. Atkinson, uh, being somebody very concerned with inequality, went to uh, the extreme of, concern, of considering a inequality uh, aversion parameter of uh, three. Now, the leaky bucket experiment uh, works on the basis of the following. If you make some minor technical assumptions and you assume further that your answer to how leaky the bucket can be depends only on the relative income of the households considered, then by answering the question, how much would you be willing to uh, tolerate as a leak. For example, when you transfer income from a household which is 10 times richer than the other one, then you're able to calibrate the inequality aversion parameter and therefore you have your welfare function. And in order to give you the intuition uh, for that, uh, you have in this table inequality aversion parameters epsilon from 0.2 to 2 and uh, relative incomes from 2 to 25. And what you see at the bottom on the right hand side is that if the relative income of households is 25 and you're willing to tolerate a loss of 99.8% of the uh, income that you get from the rich household, then your inequality aversion parameter is two. And with that parameter, we have the full uh, welfare, uh, uh, the full welfare function. Now, here I have an experiment using the Lee Zarazo Peralta uh, model, an experiment with universal basic income. On the vertical axis, you have the inequality aversion uh, parameter, 
and on the, oh, pardon me, on the horizontal axis you have the inequality aversion parameter and on the vertical axis you have deviations of welfare relative to baseline and what you see here is that the impact of universal basic income depends on what it is that you use to balance the budget, whether it is expenditure cuts or changes in taxation. In yellow, you have what happens when you give up wasteful expenditure, and in that case, the universal basic income is uh, uh, always positive for welfare irrespective of the inequality aversion parameter, but if you uh, uh, finance it with uh, a personal income tax or a value-added tax, then the uh, inequality aversion parameter becomes uh, relevant. Now, the last point that I want to make is that from an empirical viewpoint, when you compare across time or across countries, this plot is across countries, the result of the comparison using the equally distributed equivalent income is always dominated by mean income. So if you have, a, uh, if you have an aversion, uh, uh, an inequality aversion coefficient of 0.5, the correlation between GDP per capita and social welfare according to this measure is 0.998. If your inequality aversion is uh, 1.5, it's still 98%. If uh, your inequality aversion coefficient is 2, then the correlation is uh, 0.96. When you go across time and countries, even if you have an extreme case of inequality aversion of 2, what you see is that the red, which is the impact of the growth of mean income, uh, dominates the trend for almost all countries. So when we think about policy, the key aspect is to focus on policies that foster inclusive growth, and the emphasis should be both on inclusive and growth. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, the organizers and the ECB for this uh, very interesting session. Uh, I'm going to be making comments here on this topic mostly from a methodological perspective, but I'll talk about some substantive uh, issues at the very end. So I'll first ask the question uh, from the perspective of a macroeconomist, why should we care about uh, inequality? And I'll like produce a list here uh, with possible answers. There could be, first of all, feedbacks. So even if you don't care about inequality per se, there could be feedbacks from inequality to macro. So uh, as was already mentioned, the marginal propensities to make different kinds of economic decisions are perhaps not the same across the population. And as was also said, I think the evidence now is pretty clear that uh, there are large uh, differences in these marginal propensities and potentially big effects of taking into, the, uh, taking into account how wealth, for example, and income more generally spread. Secondly, there are differences in marginal propensities to, uh, to uh, make political decisions. And this may be vague, but you know, the voting behavior depends on how um, income is spread, wealth is spread, and, and maybe to take all forms of political actions. And I think that this, is, this was one of the motivations behind Piketty's uh, study and why he cares. You, you uh, worry that our institutions are challenged, perhaps, if inequality becomes too, uh, too striking, too big. So the endogenous policy channel is the second reason to care. Uh, I think inequality is important per se. Uh, Gaspar's uh, notes here somehow embed a social welfare function. And so we may have social welfare functions, and this was one way of parameterizing it in, in I think, a useful way. Um, but I think regardless of that, uh, even if you don't 
care about inequality per se. You, I think we need to report the effect of economic policy and economic institutional change uh, for different groups. And they're not the same for everybody. So the, this, the, the mere reporting of what happens as a result of policy for different groups, I think, is, is very valuable. Um, I, I also want to emphasize that I've been working on this from a perspective uh, of a macroeconomist growing up with the representative agent paradigm mainly, uh, and I think that the area of inequality uh, represents a step toward more quantitative realism that I think is a very important step. Uh, it's very hard to make this step. It has been very hard, but uh, so we have been forced to uh, use simple models for a long time, and so that makes sense. Um, but I think it is a fundamental challenge to, to the credibility of what we do as macroeconomists to have to rely on very simple models. Uh, and so I think that it, it, it's something we really have to do is to check the robustness of our results to uh, realistic inequality. And, and because there's now so much evidence that propensities, marginal propensities uh, vary across the population, this is just something we cannot avoid doing. Um, so I have, let me see, time-wise, let me just make a few more comments on this last point, uh, quantitative realism, because I meet it in my, as I go to, to uh, macro conferences, uh, let me just kind of summarize what I, uh, how I view this. So I think structural modeling in macroeconomics has been dominated by the representative agent setting. So one should ask, uh, what's so terrible about representative agents? Um, uh, certainly, uh, that's, it's still dominant as a main tool for uh, analyzing macro. And I would say it's not terrible, and it's been a very useful starting point. But uh, models often are a way of checking the logic of a point you're making. Uh, but I think, especially when you move toward policy, you also have to make sure that your logic isn't just an abstract point, but it has quantitative relevance. So our models need to, in the end, be realistic in key dimensions, as I mentioned. And I, the term I use for this is quantitative theory. Um, and I think it's what the representative agent paradigm has been up to, too. You formulate theories that capture a bunch of phenomena, you parameterize using some econometric technique, and then you use them. And they are used also at policy institutions. I think that's, that's the way things are done, but mostly within representative agent um, context. And, I, and then many ask, why is it necessary to to go beyond this. Uh, one argument that's mentioned is simple models are good because we can understand them. And it's much harder to understand uh, heterogeneous agent models. I just don't think this is a good argument. I, it's nice to understand things uh, fully, but I don't think there's an excuse for abstracting from model elements that are plausibly relevant, like inequality. I think it becomes very clear when you talk to people outside of economics. Um, Imagine that engineers had this attitude when they constructed buildings, bridges, airplanes, that they couldn't use computers, they had to just have simple formulas they could fully understand. Um, I think we need to enrich our models and, and there's really no good argument. I think it's uh, laziness and irresponsible uh, to, to, uh, to not look at this robustness properly. Okay, so I think the agenda is clear uh, to me. Uh, I think there's Still a lot of work uh, necessary to document inequalities uh, in a variety of ways. Income wealth, th those are the variables that people mostly focus on. But I think there are many other characteristics of inequality, particularly from a modeling perspective, uh, that we need, to, we, we need to open our eyes to. You know, open our eyes to breaking up the household unit into men and women, uh, in, into thinking seriously about all kinds of ways in which people differ and all kinds of ways in which marginal propensities may differ. I view this as, as just documentation is super important. Uh, we then need to analyze the causes. You know, what, what drives these characteristics, uh, how they move over time, and we saw some graphs of that. We need to develop, I think, to understand, begin understanding these things. We, we need to develop structural model, models that accommodate these inequalities. And we, look, we need to look at their consequences, uh, which involves, obviously, data and theory. And work on all of these fronts uh, has been underway for some time. So I th I'd, I'd say it's uh, a few decades. But I, I view it as having uh, picked up pace uh, recently. 
And I think there are, there are good reasons for that. Uh, one is that people have addressed the increases in inequality that we have observed. Um, and so here I will just give an example of two lines of work, uh, recent work. I mean, one, one is my own work, but it's just, I view it more, more as an example, not to push my own uh, papers on you uh, necessarily. The, <coughs> there is a piece of data here, which, which is uh, taken from a paper by Kopchuk. These are using three different measures uh, showing wealth inequality in the US over time. And it starts in uh, uh, the beginning of the 1900s and it ends in 1910. And uh, you can see the dramatic fall in wealth inequality, but also uh, depending on exactly how you, which data series you, you use, but also a significant uptick toward, toward the end beginning in uh, around 1980. Uh, so the subject of the work I wanted to talk about is that last uptick. Uh, what, is it, what does it do to? Uh, so let's account for that. And what we did in the paper was to uh, use what I would regard as the basic macroeconomic model of uh, inequality due to uh, Ayagari, Hugget, Imro, Roglu, and so on. Um, we added a bunch of elements to it, namely observable changes in, in, in things like taxes, uh, wage inequality, and so on. Uh, so we could feed into the model uh, these changes. For example, tax rates uh, decreased dramatically, beginning with the uh, Reagan administration, and progressivity of taxes decreased uh, at that time. And I'm not going to show you that graph, but th there are some major changes. There are major increases in wa wage inequality. This is something that Shetil has documented in, in his work. And there are some other ones. So here's what we find. To understand the secular uh, changes in uh, wealth inequality, these tax cuts are by far the most important factor. So the, the fact that the Reagan administration and later administrations uh, kind of being okay with decreasing tax progressivity, that basically is a huge factor uh, behind the graph I just showed you, behind the uptick. And moreover, if these tax changes are not repealed, inequality will continue to go up. This is a relatively slow process, and that's the explanation. To understand the short-run swings in wealth inequality, then you need to understand uh, something having to do with portfolio behaviors, because it turns out that wealthy, portfolio, uh, wealthy, own, wealthy households, they have a lot more equity than, uh, than, say, bonds or deposits, and the stock market swings are very, therefore very important indicator of what's happening to wealth inequality, more like in the, uh, in the short run. So this is documented by a paper, <coughs> I have like 10 seconds, by a paper uh, by Bach on Swedish data and Fagering and Al uh, on Norwegian data. Uh, so we're starting to get this registry data uh, evidence on how people save, what kinds of assets they hold. And that, that's a very important uh, factor. It's very important to understand it in going forward. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting work in the intersection of, of this empirical microdata work and structural mo modeling to understand it. Thanks. All right, thanks for having me. Good to see so many people. Uh, I'm gonna talk about distributional consequences of uh, macro policy. So, uh, in, in terms of monetary policy, inequality was not an issue. <clears throat> Why? Um, macro, arguably, was born out of the Great Depression. It, or, uh, it was created as a field then. Um, the the um, the first models, say the, the old Keynesian model, the static framework without microfoundations, that gave some huge early successes. For example, it predicted that there would not be a, a new depression after the Second World War. But the, the problem, of course, uh, is in a in a in a model, static model without uh, without f uh, properly forward-looking expectations, you can ride the Phillips curve, uh, and when when uh, people Policymakers try to take those um, um, 
implications seriously, we got stagflation. Um, so um, the rational expectation revolution started over. Uh, now, with dynamic models with explicit micro foundations, uh, including for expectations. It was natural to focus on the representative agent model for two reasons. First, those were the data available, at national income and product accounts. And second, uh, it was the models uh, that pe people could solve. So, the, 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 that model has some problems, though. First, on the one hand, <clears throat> it generates some empirical puzzles, it, excess sensitivity, a couple of risk premium puzzles, etc. Also, from a, from a stabilization point of view, the model doesn't work that well. I mean, in terms of fiscal policy, um, in, in a model with, where recording equivalence holds, it's going to be very hard to get, um, um, uh, to get uh, big effects from fiscal policy. In terms of monetary policy, the entire transmission mechanism works through the Euler equation, namely uh, the interest rate channel. Uh, so the, the, from an empirical point of view, it's, it's, it's hard to see, um, uh, it, it's hard to s believe that, uh, that that channel should be quantitatively very large. So what we like to do, what, what people want to do, of course, was to abandon this. Go for um, uh, assuming complete markets that allows us to do two things. On the one hand, break aggregation, um, so one could potentially solve these problems, and second, um, and second, um, address the fact that recessions tend to hit uh, the poor harder. Um, two, two, thing, two developments happened that, that, that really um, pushed it, that movement. On the one hand, new data became available, uh, uh, cross-sectional uh, panel data on individual wealth, consumption, income, etc. Uh, but also, new methods became available. In particular, uh, um, uh, Pea and, 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 and Tony Smith made a very fundamental contribution in terms of, in terms of providing one way to solve a, a macro model with inequality. So, uh, the, the attraction is, is, is clear. On the one hand, recording equivalence breaks down. Uh, second, the mechanism, the way the model works, uh, uh, is uh, in principle very different from the from the simple representative agent model. The, the transmission mechanism, instead of working through the interest rate channel, now you get a bunch of uh, uh, general equilibrium channels of income, consumption, labor supply, etc. The the name of the game <clears throat> is to um, is to get somehow in order for these models to have a bite over the uh, representative agent models, you need s somehow the decision rules have to be non-linear. So imagine people have, imagine right on a model where, where people have linear decision rules and there is heterogeneity. Well, clearly, uh, heterogeneity, that, that heterogeneity doesn't matter because I get exact aggregation holds. Uh, an, an, an insight from the, from the, from the early um, incomplete market models in macro literature uh, was that, for example, Iagori, decision rules are nonlinear if you're very close to the borrowing constraint. But if you're somewhat away from there, they're pretty linear. Okay? So that means if you recalibrate that model with, uh, with a, a reasonable amount of wealth, say the median person has a wealth to income ratio, uh, net worth to income ratio of, say, two and a half, well, that, that model, is, people are going to be so far from, from the nonlinear part, that model is going to behave more or less as a, as a representative agent model. So, um, uh, so a key um, uh, uh, one way to resolve that is the Kappa uh, Milante approach, where they say, look, um, uh, the rich are constrained too. Because that wealth they have, they cannot, you can't translate the house very easily into, uh, in, into liquid wealth. So, um, so, that, so that the methodological contributions, the data, um, et cetera, have given rise then to, uh, to uh, uh, literature that's growing very fast, uh, including people 
people on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England are contributing to this literature. So, so um, that's great. I'm not going to talk much about it because instead I want to talk about the, the converse. Monetary policy matters for inequality. So, so f perhaps we should think about, we should care about, we should think, put on the, pub, uh, the public finance or public economics glasses also when we think about monetary policy. So the former Fed president, uh, Narayan Korshakota, um, um, said uh, there's one key source of economic difference in American life that is, unlike, that is likely underemphasized FOMC deliberations, race. So what they had in mind was that uh, there are uh, huge differences in unemployment rates across different groups. Uh, and uh, so, so therefore, when, when, you, when you think about monetary policy, how quickly you fight unemployment, et cetera, that has distributional consequences. Um, the, 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 that were, those redistributions are, of course, at the heart of, the, of this recent heteronate, the uh, uh, macro models with heteronate. A simple way in which it, it, it happens is, is well, that, say, surprise inflation is good for borrowers and bad for savers. That was the, 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 the um, uh, or, or conversely, if you lower inflation as a surprise, that's gonna, be, that's gonna, that's gonna be bad for the borrowers. Now, uh, and, 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 the, and you could say that the Great Recession was associated with a very large shift in, in, in wealth. Uh, there is, there is an important sense, I think, in which, um, in which, in which, when we think about uh, monetary policy, uh, we forget, uh, we forget about inequality. It's not only through this, through, through the, through the, the setting of the interest rate, how that affects um, uh, inequality. Uh, remember, the uh, central banks are supposed to do two things: deliver stable inflation. And make sure the fund and, and, and provide um, uh, macro prudential policies. Make sure the financial system is, is, is stable. So, so the latter, on the one hand, the, the theoretical foundations for macro prudential policies are much, I think, weaker than for than for other forms of monetary policy. But also those policies have much stronger um, distributional consequences. So if you think about too big to fail. Uh, uh, when you when, when there's a crisis and you and you save the banks, well, then you that is that implies huge transfers from taxpayers to bank owners. Um, um, some people argue that the the, uh, the Fed in the U.S. Uh, reacts to stock market prices and effectively uh, uh, providing a put on the stock market, propping up stockholders. Uh, more more generally, macroprudential policies policies put in place in order to make sure. Banks uh, uh, to, mi to mitigate, say, too big to fail issues, um, inherently involve financial repression. Um, the, the, the problem is, and the, and the, and the tools, the, the, the tools um, um, uh, that are used uh, are involved, for example, uh, uh, pr providing uh, maximum loan to value ratios, minimum requirement. Uh, repayment requirements, uh, minimum income requirement for how much how how, how much you're allowed to borrow relative to your income, etc. Um, those policies uh, do uh, uh, force the banks to take less risk, but the cost of those policies are not borne equally across the um, uh, across the. Um, um, Population. Let me just say, uh, put the, uh, say, uh, here is what I think we should do. We should continue to explore uh, how um, firm maternity, household maternity affects the transmission mechanism on term fiscal policies. That's important. We also need to develop better models of um, macro prudential policies, embed those in general economic models, and think about how those policies have um, distribution consequences. Thank you. I would like to add a couple of brief remarks before we open the floor to questions. 
Um, there was a lot of consensus among the panelists that inequality matters to evaluate the effects of uh, macroeconomic policy and that macroeconomic policy affects inequality. I think what is also clear is um, what I would like to summarize using a quote by Heckman and co-authors. It's really dangerous to try to solve a problem if you're not sure what the, the root of that problem is. That's what we are trying to do when we understand why inequality arises before we try to change it. So on this point, I would like to only make an additional comment. Um, there is a lot of important research. We all agree that we need quantitative models to evaluate why inequality arises and what are the effects of changing it. What I would like to add is that the literature has already identified some important reasons why we have inequality, and this is, will be a very short and partial list. First of all, there is entrepreneurship. Some households might have very productive ideas and might have a very, um, might have a very positive impact on hiring people in society. So this goes back between the trade-off between efficiency and redistribution. Then the family we are born to really matters, both in terms of the bequests you will receive and the education you will receive. So that's the family and bequests and um, human capital is a very important source of inequality. Another important source of inequality is that some people might be very sick and some others might be very healthy. So health is another very important uh, source of inequality. It might also be related to the family. Other important sources of inequalities is that we might recognize that people like different things. Some people might be very patient and like to save and work a lot, and some people might have other priorities in life. So we know that these forces can be important. We need to quantify how important these sources are, and it's very exciting that a number of us are working in these models because we need to test these models, take them to data, and evaluate their implications for macroeconomic policies so that we can then reach a consensus of what are the best macroeconomic policies to address efficiency and redistributions and the leaky buckets. We need good model economies to answer these questions. So without further ado, I would like to open the floor to questions. Um, I'm hoping we have a microphone for the questions. Please keep your comments and remarks short because we would like uh, many people to have an opportunity to participate. Who would like to ask a question? Okay, well, I will start asking a question to Per. Um, I would like to ask Per, you know, in the, among the many reasons why people, we, we want ambitious models, we don't want to be lazy, we don't want to fail to get the shuttle to the moon, but uh, there is a long list why people might be unequal. Where do you think we should start? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask, but, but I, as, as you just said, there is a long list, and I think the literature has started with wealth. Uh, some are rich, some are poor. We are otherwise all the same. And this is a place to start, but I, I think that it's in the nature of the question that we don't quite know. We have, we have some introspection and from our own lives, but I, I just don't think this is wide open. The answer to this is wide open. It's not that interesting what my instincts are in some sense. Uh, but thanks for asking me, <laughs> as if I would not. Well, I'm trying to warm up the audience who is being a bit shy to start. So, please, any question that... Jeff. One big nexus that we care about is, the, is between inequality and growth. And that wasn't so clearly emphasized in other models of inequality. Um, where do we start with that? I'm sorry. <laughs> we, will, we will say something, uh, both of us. Uh, precisely, I, um, I uh, quoted the book by uh, Philippe Aguillon and uh, Jeffrey Williamson, because in that book, uh, uh, Philippe uh, uh, 
develops a theoretical model of growth, including uh, the uh, uh, distribution effects, showing indeed that there are several factors that can contribute to explain why is empirically and historically, uh, as I quoted from all those papers by Robert, uh, Robert Perotti, uh, by uh, Arezina and Roderick, Person and Tagadini, that show that there is indeed a, a negative correlation and not positive correlation between uh, uh, inequality and growth. And he then develops a model that uh, uh, has the purpose of including effects of by having more equality, there are open opportunities to more uh, entrepreneur uh, ideas and implementation and creation of uh, firms and jobs. And there is also less variability in the uh, economy. And there are a host of effects that contribute to explain what empirically has been found in those papers from the 90s. As I said, that literature was not pursued and macroeconomics uh, uh, then had another trend uh, during which distribution from the macro perspective was totally ignored. Uh, and now, of course, as a result of the crisis, this is coming back. And now, the, even the more mainstream models, uh, the SG models, now tend to be built with heterogeneous agents, so ANC models are now becoming very popular. Um, and so we see that the economists are indeed changing, uh, taking the lessons of the crisis. Um, and I think it's a very uh, good uh, development. Uh, we need to uh, see more of this uh, these work. Uh, although my view about future developments of inequality are quite pessimistic and qu quite septic that advanced economies will uh, have significant corrections to the inequality that exists uh, because what uh, commands uh, are the more structural factors and there uh, technological developments, robotization, artificial intelligence, uh, polarization of uh, labor markets and of firms, uh, all that uh, goes in the direction of an aggravation of uh, uh, inequality. Uh, and uh, uh, only more significant interventions in redistribution of endowments could change that. Uh, but it's very unrealistic, uh, we think. And when we look to the um, inverted U of Kuznets, and we see why during a long period of time, since 1914 until 1970, there was a reduction of inequality, then we have to count uh, that there were two wars, that there was the Cold War that uh, also stimulated higher taxes and transfers and the build up of welfare states in other advanced economies. All that is gone, so we are not going to see another wave of the same kind. Uh, and so that's why I am pessimistic about that. But it's important that the economists do their work. Um, indeed, I was going to quote, and I will finish with that, because it's a good quote in my view, uh, that uh, uh, indeed we many times talk about welfare enhancing measures just pointing to potential varietal improvement measures, not taking into account any distribution. And uh, in 1973, Kenneth Harrell, addressing the annual meeting of the American Economic Association, said, that, the, uh, I quote, the world is full of injustices and the writings of economists are full of attempts to disguise them. So let's hope that uh, with the uh, lessons learned in the aftermath of the crisis, uh, indeed uh, we uh, see a different uh, pattern uh, evolving as we are already seeing it. And uh, it's quite clear that things have uh, started to change. If I may, uh, you went straight to the heart of my presentation. Uh, so the, the point that I try to emphasize right at the end is that inclusive growth should emphasize both the inclusive element and the growth element. But the, quite apart from this policy message, from a research viewpoint, the question that you raise is very challenging. And I cannot do justice to the complexity of the question that you put, but I, there's a tension that I want to stress. 
Uh, Robert Lucas, in his uh, Industrial Le Revolutions Past and Future, he basically uh, conjectures that uh, growth will always trump inequality in terms of long-run trends. And if you go to the last slide that I present with a data set of 135 countries and several decades, that's what you see even with a very high parameter of inequality aversion, the trends are dominated by growth. But this is not the end of the story. Because when you look at policies and how policies impact inequality and they impact growth, you actually are not able to document a trade-off. That is, when you try to see if growth is impaired by inequality or by inequality promoting policies like tax progressivity, you do not find robust empirical evidence. And if you want to know more, you should definitely open the fiscal monitor that we are coming, uh, putting out in the fall. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thanks. I, I want to ask the, the panel, not just Victor, Constancio, uh, a question that derives Vito, from one of your of your charts. Very striking, very well known, but you know, s still striking. The difference in income distribution between the euro area, as you computed it at the at the ECB, sort of this aggregate, and the US. Okay, it's very very striking, and you know how how it has evolved. Now, I want to get from there to monetary policy. Um, let's say we have a world of two countries, the US and the Euro area, with the characteristics of the difference in income distribution that you have. My question is, what consequence does that have for the conduct of monetary policy in the two areas? Is that one of the reasons why we have a different mandate of monetary policy across the two sides of the Atlantic. What are the consequences of that? Can the, uh, the panel, not just Victor, address that question? Because uh, no one else says anything. Uh, I mean, what are the causes of that? I, I think, uh, I think the, the, the design of these institutions and the focus is, uh, of these two uh, central bank areas weren't primarily motivated, but that, that's my belief, and weren't primarily motivated by this. They, they, they were motivated by, by historical events uh, with a focus partly on unemployment, um, of course, but unemployment is just one piece of of the whole inequality picture. So, so I, I, I just don't believe that that, that, that was the case and, uh, and that a reassessment might uh, suggest completely different uh, reasons why we should you know, potentially have different policy. But I, I don't think that the literature is ready to suggest how we should design our institutions yet because I think this area is, is evolving very rapidly and it, which means we're learning a lot in real time, so, so uh, and it would be, would be hazardous to draw conclusions too early, really. I think Kietil has a final remark before okay. we close. Just to re reply to that um, question. So, yeah, um, uh, there are many differences, not only in terms of inequality, um, but, to, but also there are also a lot of other uh, institutions and market forces uh, that interact with inequality with respect to, to, to stabilization policy. Let me give an example. The bankruptcy law. So in many European countries, you cannot go bankrupt. The bank can, if they are nice to you, they can forgive you the debt. But the banks don't really bear the burden if house prices fall. So that, that has huge implications of, on the one hand on the distribution, but also on the bank stability. And whereas in, in, in the US you have the possibility of strategic, strategic default, that obviously has to, will induce, uh, uh, must induce large differences in, in both uh, in macro prudential policy, uh, monetary policy and so on. I, I agree with the pair. I think we are a bit away 
we're, we're not there yet uh, in terms of uh, uh, saying exactly uh, the details of how those, what those differences should be. Um, but I think we should get there. Thank you very much to the, our panelists and to the audience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very briefly, um, I don't think it's about uh, monetary policy or monetary uh, uh, framework. Uh, the, the main difference is one should look much more, as Per said, to tax, taxation and transfers and the welfare state and all that. That's the big, those are the big differences, uh, indeed. Um, and when we look to the distribution of wealth, what dominates in terms of the effects is house prices not so much stock prices, uh, and, uh, uh, and in what regards income is mostly unemployment. And where we are, when we are in a, a period, as we are now, and uh, where we had to apply uh, unconventional monetary policies, it was because inflation was low, and so we need expansionary policies, which then provides a coincidence with the objective of unemployment. And that's uh, a, uh, uh, the situation which explains why the type of unconventional monetary policies has contributed mostly to reduce unemployment, which then uh, is more relevant for the low incomes, which are the people more with higher probability of getting unemployed, then benefit most, and the same in terms of house prices, at least in Europe, after the big drop in house prices, because now we are applying those unconventional policies uh, in a period where that helped to uh, uh, increase again uh, house prices, and that's how, how we get those results that I showed uh, in my slides, which are related to the period since 2015. Uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, what I uh, wanted to add. Also to add that uh, uh, a more extended version of uh, my remarks can be found already in the site of the ECB. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.